Good evening, everyone. It's good to be here. Thank you for the introduction, Pastor Johnny. I've known him for many years, back when we were both um, looking, uh, what would the word be? <laughs> Slimmer and fitter. Uh, <laughs> But it's good to be here, uh, here in Singapore. It's my first time here in Singapore. My wife has been here several times before, but it's my first time here. Just got in yesterday, flew in from England, and I've appreciated the warmth and the hospitality that I have experienced so far, and I'm glad to be here with you at this, this church. As we begin this week, um, on this, this journey that we're going to be taking this week, our first uh, presentation this evening is called, Where Do I Come From? Where do I come from? And I'd like to invite you to bow your heads for a word of prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, Lord, we pause to thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the privilege that we have to open your word together. And I pray, Lord, as we go on this journey this week, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be with us, illuminate our minds, and impress our hearts, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. The question, where do I come from, is one that we often ask, or we often actually ask it of other people. Where do you come from? And when we're asked that question, sometimes we, we have to think once or twice or thrice as to how we answer that question. Growing up as I did in England, I am the son of two first-generation immigrants. So growing up, whenever I was asked that question, where do you come from, I'd always kind of have to think twice or qualify my answer. Now, some of you may relate to this. Maybe you were born outside Singapore, and when you get asked the question, where do you come from, you're, you're wondering, are they asking where do I live, or are they asking like where I was born? And so growing up in England, where do you come from? Do I say I'm from Hatton, or do I say I'm from England, or do I say I'm from where my parents come from? But even though I would sometimes say where my parents come from, I was never actually born there. My mother, some of you are looking at me and you're wondering, where is he from? <laughs> and what I found is that for some reason, I found that the way that I look, I can kind of fit in and be a lot of different things in different places. <laughs> so I found that when I go to the United States of America, they look at me and they're like, ah, Mexicano. <laughs> Colombia, when I'm there. I found that when I go to um, Europe, sometimes they think I come from, you know, like uh, south of Spain or, or, you know, the Mediterranean area, they sometimes think. Or some people think that I come from the Middle East. Oh, you look like Lebanese or you look Israeli or something like that. And then when I was in South Africa, they're like, oh, yeah, you look like you're colored or something like that. And then when I'm in South America, they thought I was from there. I don't think you think I'm Singaporean. <laughs> I don't know, maybe. <laughs> but my mother is from Iceland, and my father is from Mauritius. So you've got an Iceland, an island, sorry, in the north, north, north that touches the Arctic Circle. That's where my mother comes from. And then you've got an island that's off the coast of Madagascar. Little island of Mauritius, and that's where my father comes from. And then we came out, all of us children, looking somewhere in the middle. <laughs> and unfortunately, I don't speak Icelandic, and I don't speak... Um, Creole is what they speak there, broken French. I don't speak that either. Um, I just came out and just speak English, unfortunately. But it's a question that, you know, when I was growing up, my mother would always tell me, you're half Icelandic and half Mauritian. You're half Icelandic, half Mauritian. Half Icelandic, half Mauritian. And so I would always grow up saying to people, that's what I was. Where do you come from? Let me share with you a little bit about my wife as well. Uh, this is the picture there. You can see my, that's my father, that's my mother. And then the man in the middle is my wife's um, father. And then that's my wife's mother, and then that's my wife's grandmother. And this was the day that we got married on October the 27th, 2013, in San Francisco. It was a lovely day, so that's my wife's family. Now, my wife's dad is called Richard, Richard Reichard, and my wife's mother is called Joan, like Joan of Arc. Her grandmother, though, is called 
Midori, which is the Japanese name. Now, this is, the, this is another picture of the family. You have there her sister there, and there's the grandmother there. This is a picture was taken on her 100th birthday. Um, she's still alive, still going strong, and she's a testament to good health. Every day she eats like a fruit for breakfast every day. Even now, she goes for like half a mile or a mile walk every morning. She does her gardening every day. Her mind is sharp. Um, and get this, she learned how to email when she was 97 years old. 97 years old. When she was 99 years old, she sent me an email. This is my wife's grandmother saying, um, I know you're coming to visit us next week. I would like you to preach in my church. Please respond to this email with a yes. <laughs> Thank you. When you're 99 years old and you write someone who's my age an email and you say, please respond with a yes, I have no choice. Um, she's a lovely lady, though. Anyway, she's sitting there. So that's my wife's family. And uh, that was on our wedding day. That's kind of my wife's extended family. And you'll see that the majority of the, you see there, there's an uncle, 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 and her mother is there. Now, the reason why I'm showing this picture is interesting. My wife, is there another picture? There we are. There's her mother and her and her brothers and her brothers. So you've got grandmother there, her name is Midori, Hirabayashi, very Japanese name. Then you have Dean, Mark, Glenn, and Joan. <laughs> then you have my wife, Aiko, and her sister, Midori. But in the, so you've got Midori, grandmother, Aiko, Midori, grandchildren, and in the middle you've got Joan, Dean, Glenn, and Mark. Now, I don't know how good your Japanese is, but my Japanese is good enough to let me know that Joan, Glenn, Dean, and Mark are not Japanese names. They are very English, American, Western names. Now, the question is why? Why? Well, in order to kind of, why was it that you've got a Japanese name, your mother's got a Japanese name, your grandchildren actually ended up with them, but in the middle, you've got Joan, Glenn, Dean, and Mark. Well, you've got to rewind back about 75 years in history, and you find that in the year 1941, World War II was in motion already in Europe and was brewing in the Pacific. And as it was brewing in the Pacific, in particular, there was a threat that the Japanese were going to invade into the United States. Now, as this threat was going on for the Japanese to invade into the United States, the American government did a survey, uh, research on the West Coast. And the research was called the Munson Report because of the man who did the report. His name, uh, is it Charles? Charles uh, Curtis Munson. He did a report where he said, after visiting with the Japanese American community on the West Coast, he found out and he said that there is no threat. The Japanese on the West Coast, he says, they're remarkably an even extraordinary sense of loyalty, and there's no problem from the Japanese community on the West Coast. That was his report to the US government, the Munson Report. He said, there's no need for military action. We've got no threat of an insurrection or uprising, or there's going to be no homegrown terrorists. Everything's fine. However, as we read there, there'll be no uh, uh, armed uprising of the Japanese for the most part. They're very loyal. And he said, everything's fine. But then, on the 7th of December, 1941, under the command of General, I believe it was, uh, I forgot his name, um, they flew about 350 different planes. They bombed in the, uh, the Pearl Harbor. You know the story. They sank and they killed about 2,500 2, soldiers. And then that signaled America's entrance into World War II. Now, what then took place, you know, is the beginning of America's time into World War II, but also began kind of a dark stain on America's recent history. Because not long after that, people on the West Coast or in the United States government started to say, we've got to round up the Japanese and put them into camps. Now, here we have a congressman, John uh, Rankin, who said, I'm for catching every Japanese in America, Alaska, and Hawaii, and putting them in concentration camps. He said, damn them, let's get rid of them. December the 15th, 1941, that's a week after Pearl Harbor. Then, what, else, what, what did actually happen? Here, Henry McClure, uh, San Francisco uh, examiner. I am for the immediate removal of every Japanese on the West Coast to a point deep in the interior. I don't mean a nice part as well, he said. I mean, uh, you know, 
the Badlands. He said, I hate the Japanese, and that goes for all of them. And so there was this rise of this anti-Japanese feeling, and then Franklin and Roosevelt signed the order on February the 19th, 1942, where he said, I hereby authorize and direct the Secretary of War and the military commanders to prescribe military areas in such places and of such extent as he or she may appropriate military commander may determine from which any of these persons may be excluded. And so they, they rounded up the Japanese on the West Coast and they put them into Kansas, Arkansas, Nebraska, different places there. They called them internment camps, but it was essentially like a concentration camp. And they just kind of took the properties and so on. My, my wife's grandmother, they used to own a farm in what would be today Cupertino, Silicon Valley. Very high price, but just taken, gone. Now. Gary Akihiro said Pearl Harbor merely triggered the, uh, the gun loading of previous two decades, or more correctly, of the anti-Japanese movement that spanned the entire range of the history from plantation to concentration camp. And this person said it was during those 48 hours that I saw some of the most unscrupulous vultures in the form of human beings taking advantage of bewildered housewives whose husbands had been rounded up. They were offered pittances for their belongings. And it was a sad period of Japanese history. So my wife's grandmother, she, um, she actually kind of escaped, quote unquote, the West Coast, and she went to live in Denver, Colorado during the war before the roundup. Uh, in, in hindsight, she reflects and says, it would have probably been better for me to go to the camp, because at least I would have been with my people, whereas where I was kind of trying to live in freedom, I experienced so much prejudice there in Denver, Colorado. Her grandfather, though, he went to the camp, and he was there in a camp in Arkansas, and he was there for the period of the war when the war, actually during the war, they got married, and when the war was finished, they said, we need to move somewhere where we'll experience less prejudice. So they decided to move to Hawaii, because Hawaii was about 30 or 40 or 50% Japanese. They said, let's move to Hawaii. There'll be less prejudice there, and let's kind of start our family over there. So as they move, with this in mind, you've spent time in a camp, you've spent time. Now bear in mind that my wife's grandparents were both born in the United States. They had American passports, they were American citizens, they were born there, but even despite all of that, still sent, they decided to move to Hawaii and they went there to Hawaii and they had four children. And it wasn't in the age where it was cool to be multicultural, it wasn't the age where it was cool to have dual passports, it wasn't the age when it was cool to have like two or three languages in the, in the home. They kind of wanted to get away from that side of their identity, and so they named their children Dean, Joan, Glenn, and Mark. They gave them as American-sounding names as possible. Now, whether they did that intentionally or whether that was just kind of subconscious, I'm not exactly sure. But when you kind of understand the background, you can understand why. They, weren't, they didn't speak Japanese in the house. They didn't, uh, that wasn't a language that was spoken. So. Aiko's mother, who's full-blood Japanese, doesn't speak any Japanese. My wife does, though. She went to community college. She learned and kind of, when she was growing up now, it was now more culturally acceptable to kind of be in touch with your roots or be in touch with your Japanese side in America. So she kind of went there. She's traveled there. She's lived there for three years. She speaks the language. She has a Japanese name. But the difference between her generation, at least in, in her family, not every family is the same, and that of her, her mother's generation is quite interesting. And it's when you understand the background of where you come from that you understand why that is today. Now, when we look at ourselves in a human sense, when we look at our families, it's always interesting to know where does my family come from? Where does my heritage in my, in my bloodline come from? And some of us, we like to get in touch with our history is how did my mother meet my father? How did my grandparents meet each other? What jobs did they do? Does that have an impact on me today? And we look back into our family tree, and as we look back into our family tree, we learn something about ourselves today. You know, I look back in my family tree, and I know that my grandfather was a, was a fisherman, and my uncle was this, and you start to paint this kind of, ah, oh, that's why I do that, and that's why I do that. As I look back, it was, it was when I looked back in my, my mother's family tree, actually, and I looked at all the men in my mother's family tree, that I realized that I had no chance of growing my hair beyond the age of 20. <laughs> like, every uncle on my mother's side has no hair. Both my granddads, you know, if it's a, if from the mother, both my granddads, no hair. Every male on that side, no hair. So I knew I was, you know, that's it. No hair is going to come. And when you look back, you can kind of understand some of your heritage as to where you come from. Now in life, 
the questions that we ask in life, the big three questions in life that we ask, is where do I come from? And that's what we kind of mentioned just a bit. Where do I come from myself? Another question that society asked in general, not just Christians, but society is, where am I going? Like, where's my future going to be? And another question that we ask related to that is then, in light of where I've come from and where am I going, or why am I even here? And it's a question that you and I have to ask. Why am I here in the year 2017 here in Singapore? Where have I come from and where am I going to be going? Now, as individuals, we ask those questions, but also as Christians, it's an important question to ask. Where have we come from as a Christian church over the years? Where are we going? And what is the purpose for us being here? Understanding our past is integral to knowing why we're here in the present, and it also drives us as to where we're going in the future. Now, in the Bible, there's several examples of people that kind of had this connection as to where they came from, and it gave them identity in the present moment. See, today, people are always wondering, what is my identity? Who am I? Where do I come from? What is my purpose for being here? And understanding where we have been to helps us to understand why we are here today. If you have a Bible, open it up to the book of Genesis, chapter 39. And in Genesis 39, there's a story. We're just going to breeze through some of the verses. Don't worry, we're not going to read six chapters. Um, Genesis chapter 39 is the story of Joseph. Now, Joseph is one of the highlighted characters often in the Bible. Joseph lived an amazing life. Um, He went from being, um, well, he was his father's favorite son. He was his father's favorite son. And, you know, in fact, you have to go back to chapter 37. In chapter 37, he was his father's favorite son, and his father said, go see, my, go see the other sons and take them some, some food. So he takes them some food to his other sons, and as he takes food to his, other, the, his brothers, rather, they grab him, put him in a pit. And after they put him in a pit, they're not sure what to do with him. Some of them say, let's kill him. Other ones say, no, we can't kill him. And then they see their cousins on, on, the, um, on the camels coming by, their distant cousins, and they're like, oh, let's sell them to our cousins. So they sell Joseph, to their cousins. Imagine the shame. They sell him to his cousins, the Midianites. And then the Midianites take him to Egypt and say, ah, we'll sell our cousin to Potiphar. So they sell him to Potiphar. And at the age of about 17 or 18, he's moved from his home. He's gone to a different place. And the Bible says he's there in Egypt. And as he's working in Egypt, he's there working. The Bible says um, uh, he's working in the house. If you're not familiar with the story, read through the details some some time later on. But in Genesis 39, he's working in the house of Potiphar, and he's doing everything in the house when Potiphar's wife, and this is why the Bible is such a real book, Potiphar's wife cast her eyes on him, and she quite likes the look of this man. Her husband's always at work. He's got this nice, fine young man in the house, and she likes to look at him, and she says to him, hey, come. And Joseph, though, answers... Joseph answers, says he refuses. And it tells us something powerful. He's left home. He's got no restraints on him. He's got no authority over him morally in that sense, like his parents or whatever, or his church. He's left home, and she's like, hey, come lie with me. No one else is going to know. And he says, no. No. He's only about 18. He says, no. Verse 9 says, There is none greater in this house than I. Neither has he kept any back from you, because you are are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against who? And sin against God. At this age of 18, he understood very clearly that he couldn't do what she was asking him to do because it would violate his relationship with, with God. It would violate who he had already pledged to be, and he says, no, he's left home. So then we go, on in, we go on in the story, and Joseph then gets locked up in prison because he gets locked up in prison because um, she, she, screams, she screams rape. He gets locked up in prison. He's there in prison. We don't know for how long. It's about 10 years probably. And while he's there in prison, it wasn't prison like today. It was probably a very nasty prison. He's there locked up in prison with no hope of release or parole. And, and then 
he, there's a story of the baker and the butler, but then in chapter 41, you, have, you fast forward, and now there's a man, and Pharaoh has a dream, and the man who's listening to the dream says, ah, I remember a man in prison when I was in prison, and he can interpret dreams. Let's call him out. So they call out Joseph, and they call him out of prison. Bear in mind, he's been in prison for about 12 years, from the age of probably 18 to the age of 30. He's lived his best decade, you could say, of his life in prison, in chains, in damp in cold, in humility. And as he comes out of prison, he's asked by Pharaoh to interpret this dream. And notice what he says there in verse 15. Pharaoh says to Joseph, I have dreamed a dream and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard them say of you that you can interpret the dreams. Verse 16, and Joseph answered Pharaoh. These are his first words out of his mouth that we have recorded after being in prison for 12 years. First words out of his mouth. And Joseph answered Pharaoh and said, it is not in me. What does he say? God shall give you what? An answer of peace. His first words of response was to remind Pharaoh and maybe reminding himself, I belong to who? I belong to God and God is going to answer you. After 12 years in prison, he has not forgotten where he came from. After 12 years in prison, he remembers exactly who he is. So Pharaoh's quite impressed with this man. He tells him, you know, there's going to be seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. Pharaoh's like, hmm, wise man. He says, we need someone to control the kingdom. And if you read later in the chapter, he says, I don't know anyone as wise as you. And this is fascinating. Why is it fascinating? Because, because he's only known him for five minutes. There's no relationship. He's known him for five minutes, and he's like, you're the wisest man here. I'm going to make you the head of the kingdom, only under me. And so he makes Joseph the prime minister of Egypt, and Joseph runs the country. And it's fascinating when you look at some of the historical evidence showing how Joseph was running the country at that time. So Joseph runs the country. And then you have the story where now you're having the seven years of, of, what's it called? Seven years of famine. And during the seven years of famine, now Joseph's 11 other brothers are running out of food. And so they come to Egypt, and they don't know, but Joseph knows. They come to Egypt, and they come before him, and they're asking for some food. And then Joseph starts to play some games. He says, okay, I'll give you some food. And he puts a cup in one of their bags and locks one of them up, and he's trying to play you know, a few games with them to see if they're honest and see if they've changed their ways. And he asked them if they have another brother, and they say there's a younger brother. He says, bring the younger brother. They say, we can't bring the younger brother. Our dad will be scared. He doesn't want to, he's already lost one son. He doesn't want to lose another. They say, listen, you better bring the younger brother. They finally bring the younger brother, and they come back there to, um, they come back there to Egypt. And it's there in chapter 45. And now Joseph now would have been prime minister. He would be in his early 40s. He would be about 42, 43. He hasn't seen some of his brothers now for more than half his life more than half his life he hasn't probably spoken Egyptian sorry he hasn't spoken Hebrew for over 20 years he's spoken Egyptian he hasn't been called Joseph for over 20 years he's been called whatever name the Egyptians gave him so no, no language no name Everything different. And in chapter 45, it says, And Joseph could not refrain himself before them that stood by him and cried, Cause every man to go out from here. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known to his brethren. Verse 2, And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said to his brethren, What does he say? I am who? Joseph. He's been away now for over 20 years, 25 years or so. 12 years in prison, seven years of plenty. He's now in the seven years of famine, and he hasn't spoken Hebrew. He hasn't seen his brothers, but as he sees his brothers, he remembers his identity. He looks at them, and he says, I am Joseph. Does my father yet live? He was someone that, though he was far removed from where he was, he remembered his identity, he remembered his past, he remembered where he had come from, and in his present, it guided who he was. Knowing our past is important. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 18. John chapter 18, we have a different story there in John chapter 18. In John chapter 18, in John chapter 18, it's the story of Peter. And in John chapter 18... Verse 6. 
John chapter 18, verse 6, the Bible says, and as soon as, this is the story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's there in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the Roman soldiers come. And Jesus says to them, he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I, I, I have told you that I am he, and if therefore you seek, you seek me, let all these others go away. He was with his disciples. Let them go away. And then verse 10, Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear, and his name was Malchus. Here you've got Peter standing with Jesus, so proud to be with Jesus, so proud to be one of his servants, so proud to be identified with Jesus, that when Jesus is about to be taken away, he's trying to defend Jesus, and he, oh, well, the Bible says he cut the man's ear off. I think he was trying to cut his head off. Because no one goes like that. I think he went like that. And as he went like that, the man went like that, and his ear went off. That's my imagination, but, you know, I'm not quite sure. Either way, he cut a man's ear off in defense of Jesus. He cut a man's ear off because he was associated with Jesus. And in the very same chapter, we come down then to verse, verse 25. Simon Peter stood there and warmed himself, then said unto him, Are you not one of his, what? Disciples. This is the same chapter. It's less than 12 hours removed from when he's cut a man's ear off, defending his relationship with Jesus, and now, 12 hours on, you're one of the disciples. And the Bible says he what? He denies it. Are we sometimes like Peter? Peter? When we may be in a place like this, we may be in a church, we may be around everyone, brother this, sister that, hey, good to see you, happy this, happy that. And then just 12 hours removed, sometimes 12 minutes removed from the front gate, and whew, we're a different person. Here's Peter, I'm not one of them. And you know the story, they ask him again, are you sure? I'm sure you're one of them. I'm sure you're one of them. He's like, mm mm, definitely not. And then to make kind of even prove that he's not one of them, he starts cursing and swearing. To kind of extra prove that I'm not one of them. Here we have an example of someone that really doesn't quite know who he is. In one minute he's defending Jesus, cutting people's ears off, the next minute he's denying with cursing and swearing unsure of where he's come from, and he has little purpose in the present except to fill a sad prophecy that he would, not a prophecy, to fill a sad prediction that he would deny Jesus. Forgetting where he came from and forgetting who he was impacted him in the present time in a negative way. In Daniel, turn to Daniel. Daniel chapter 6 verse 10. Powerful story in Daniel. In Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10, you've got Daniel who's there. It's a, a story of Daniel and the lion's den. Daniel is an old man now. You have the 70 years of captivity that have gone. He was a captive at the age of 17-ish. You've got 70 years of captivity. And now in Daniel chapter 6, you have the Persian Empire ruling. And Daniel would have been in his late 80s. He was an old man. And the Bible says that they wanted to trap Daniel. They wanted to put him in a box. They wanted to lock him up. But the only way they could do that, the Bible says they searched for a reason to trap Daniel and checked all the financial records. They checked all the committee minutes. They checked everything he had ever done concerning his work life, and they could find nothing was wrong with Daniel. Now, if you've been in politics or you know politicians or you imagine politicians, most of us would say if they've been in politics that long, it's not all clean. Daniel, though, was there for 70 years, squeaky clean. Squeaky clean. And then, they say, we've got to set him up concerning his prayer life. The Bible says in verse 10 that Daniel knew the writing was signed, past tense. He went into his house, present tense. And with his windows being open in his bedroom toward Jerusalem, he kneeled down upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did what? Before. There's a passage in the book of Kings or Chronicles which says when you go as a captive in the land of Babylon, when you go as a captive and you're there as a captive, pray towards your city and the Lord will hear your prayers. 
Daniel had been following this for the last 70 years. He remembered where he came from. He remembered he was a Hebrew. He remembered his people were going back home. And so every day he was praying for his people. And it didn't matter what the king said. It didn't matter what law the king said. He was going to pray for his people, pray towards his city, regardless of what the law of the land or whatever said. He remembered where he came from. He knew his people were going back home, and it guided him in his present. As we are Christians today, as we look back to where the Christian church has come in the past, see, it's 2,000 years since New Testament times, and the Christian church has come a long way in those 2,000 years. We've gone from being a Middle Eastern slash African religion to being a predominantly European religion to now being something that's worldwide. Christianity has gone from being persecuted, it's gone from being illegal, it's gone to being popular, it's gone to institutional, and in some parts of the world, it's now just complete indifference. Christianity has gone through all these changes. It's gone through all these ups, it's gone through all these downs, and it kind of is, depending where you are in the world, maybe on a different scale or maybe a different word, may characterize it. I come from England, it's pretty indifferent there. Say so it's in a post-Christian country. But it's good for us to understand where we come from spiritually, individually, but also where the Christian church has come from. And throughout this week, we're going to be looking at some key lessons highlighted throughout history and some of the lessons that we can learn and some of the impacts that it has on us today. For the Christian church today, who you are today didn't form in a vacuum. It doesn't just happen. There's a background, there's a heritage to everything that's happened. There have been turning points of history. The translation of the Bible was a key turning point of history. You could say the protest of the princes and the concept of religious liberty was a key turning point of history. The breakaway of different Protestant groups was a turning point of history. The Lutheranism, Calvinism, Methodism, Anglicanism, the rise of America as a country as a whole, these were all turning points in world history and turning points for the Christian church. And so for us in the year 2017, it's important to understand our identity today, but in understanding our identity today, it's important for us to understand where we've come from because it impacts who we are today. There's a quotation I put on the screen earlier where it says, history is inextricably linked to identity. If you don't know your history, if you don't know where you come from, then who are you? We need to know where we come from to know who we are today. Edmund Burke said, and several other people have said similar to this, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. We need to know where we come from. The lessons from the past, that we don't repeat the bad lessons, and we know our identity today. You know, I was in England filming for um, the lineage series that some of you may have seen, and we went to the city of Cambridge, just pictures taken from the Wesley House in Cambridge, and we weren't planning to film in the Wesley House, Wesley, John Wesley. Um, we weren't planning to film at the Wesley House. We were filming in the building just next door, which was the Jesus College of Cambridge University, because that's where, I think it was, uh, that's where Latimer went to school. And so we're walking on our way there to this, this college just to do a little uh, bit of our script outside there. And we walk past this building, the, the Wesley House. I said, oh, Wesley House. Never heard of this, didn't know it was there. Let's walk inside and ask a few questions. So we walk inside that gate there, and there was a little door there, and a lady came out to see us. She was a lady at the front desk. She comes out to see us, and she says, ah, she's, you know, saying hello and all the rest. And as we're standing there, we're talking to her, and she's like, yeah, this is the Wesley House. And we're kind of asking questions, like, what, what, what is, what's this building here? She says, oh, the Wesley House is the, is the college here in Cambridge that trains Methodist ministers. So we're like, ah, Cambridge? That's like top educational place in the world. And you've got the college that trains the Methodist ministers. This is like one of the foremost institutions training Methodist ministers in the whole world. And she says, we're right across the road from, I forget what the name of the college was, and they train the Anglican ministers, Church of England. That's Church of England, we're Methodists, right across the road from each other. One of the best schools in the world training Methodist ministers. Oh, okay. Oh, so who was, uh, so I'm asking a few questions. Oh, okay, so Methodism. And she starts to give me some information. And John Wesley, you know, was one of the founder of Methodism, and John Wesley was an American, and, and she starts to go on. Now, I don't know how well you know your history. John Wesley was born in Lincolnshire. 
He spent most of his life traveling all around England by horseback. He lived in London and is died and buried in London. And so as she said it, she was saying a lot of things. And she just dropped there, and John Wesley from America. Now, I know John Wesley traveled to America, but she told me, and I was like, did she just say he's from America? I'm like, I'm at the Wesley House in Cambridge, though. And this lady is paid by the Wesley House in Cambridge. Like, surely I didn't just hear that. You know, it's like trying to tell me that the Pope comes from Barcelona or, you know, whatever. I was like, ah. So I was listening, and I saw, she said, I said, <laughs> I said so, so where did you say John Wesley's from? In a very kind of unassuming English way. She said, oh, he's from America. I was like, oh, oh, okay. Now my cameraman next to me is like, because we had literally just been the other place the day before to film his birthplace. We videotaped it. And he's next to me, trying his best not to like crease over laughing. <laughs> and I'm like, hmm, okay, so, so from America, okay. And she was trying to convince us that Methodism was an American religion founded by John Wesley. I'm like, Methodism was founded in England. It went to America. Yes, it went big in America, but it was from England. And John Wesley was born, raised, and died in England. And here I was in the Wesley house with a lady telling me that Methodism was an American religion founded by an American. And she's paid by them. And that kind of story, as we were filming the whole series of lineage on church history, kind of just stands out to me. Of how when your identity from the past is forgotten, where do you come from? Why are you here? Where are you going? May we know where we come from individually, but more importantly, we need to know our spiritual heritage. And we need to know where we come from. Like Joseph. Joseph never forgot who he was. And even after not speaking Hebrew for 24 years, he says, I am Joseph. Does my father yet live? I pray that our identity may be key, that we may be rooted and grounded, that we may not be wavering in who we are, and that as we go on this journey this week, as we understand where we come from in the past, it gives us identity in the present, and it gives us purpose and mission as we go into the future. Let's bow our heads as we close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we pause to thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you, Lord, that you have given each one of us a unique story. That each one of us hold an individually unique story and our path here has been different, each one of us. And we thank you, Lord, for the journey of our own individual lives that we've lived in the generations before us. And I pray, Lord, that we would remember where we have come from and that we may have a strong understanding of our own identity in you today. As a song we sometimes sing in church says, in Christ alone I stand. May we truly stand in you today. Bless us, Lord, as we leave this place. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.